Good evening. This is week three of Laws 11059 Statutory Interpretation. We're in term three of 2017. Thank you for those who have joined us live. I appreciate that greatly. Well, I've got good news tonight. I'm going to give you a huge exam tip straight away. So to get you into a good mood and ready to embark on your studies for the examination. I'll let you know why I'm being so generous um, shortly. So to lead into that, let's look at what we've got in mind for the next five or six weeks. I'll share the screen, hopefully successfully. Let's hope it doesn't buffer too much. Can you see a Word document looking ahead with some dates? Have I got the correct page? Great. Yes. Great. All right. So tonight we're dealing with interpretation of legislation. Chapter three. Now the Samson, Samson's book is really good. In Samson's book is really good, in that um, she has identified each week by way of chapter. So the the week number corresponds to the chapter number. So you should be keeping up with your reading. It's very easy textbook to read. I think it's really well thought out. Next week we have. Context and Purpose, which is Chapter 4. Then we have a vacation week in the week commencing the 4th of December. Now, in Week 5, I'm going to record a lecture. I'm recording some lectures for Introduction to Law in Relation to Legal Research. I propose to provide those with you as well. And the task is due on the Thursday, so I don't want to give you um, I don't want to burden you with having to attend one of these sessions the night before that is due for the first task, and I think I mentioned that last week. So there'll be no live lecture on in week five. In week six, we're back to normal for intrinsic materials. Then we have Christmas, and then we have New Year. New Year's always a tough week for people, so I'm just going to do recorded lectures that week in week seven, and I'll put, put that online as soon as I can. And then week eight, we're back to normal for extrinsic materials. However, um, I do note that we've got an assessment due in week eight as well. So I'll, I may revisit that, but at this stage, that's a live lecture. So are there any questions about what we've got coming up and the timetable? Is that all fine? Okay. So the exam hint. And what I'm looking to do, if you can just bear with me a moment. All right. The exam hint is this. The exam is online. It's Proctor U. You are entitled to be at your computer. And I want you to have access to the internet. It is essentially entirely an open book examination. That means that you can access any resources online that you wish. The exam will be in two parts. From memory, it's a 60% examination. 10% will be basic essay question. 50% will be a problem solving question. And I'll give you an idea of what we've done in the past, certainly from my point of view, um, to give you some idea of what I mean by a problem solving question in the context of statutory interpretation. The, legisl the problem is when I set an exam, I usually have the problem based on a make-believe legislation. But on this occasion, so but on this occasion, I'm going to make it based on actual legislation. You see, I've got an advantage in that we have a very significant change to existing legislation in relation to the Work Health and Safety Act 2011. The change this year through the amendment bill creates a brand new set of laws which is open to interpretation. So rather than you interpret something which is me creating some make-believe legislation, we're going to work off the real thing for the examination. So in the exam, you know that the problem will be based on the Work Health and Safety Act of 2011. What that means is that when you're reading your material, I want you to do so in the context of thinking about that piece of legislation and think about the amendment bill 
which is now the Amendment Act of 2011. While you're doing that, you could refer specifically to the Queensland Legislation Handbook and you can think about some of the issues that might be relevant to statutory interpretation. I mean, for example, one of the questions that I might give you in the exam might be in relation to interpreting the word person. And I might say that it includes a corporate body. Justify that by reference to the legislation. So your job will be to look at the legislation, look at the Amendment Act, think about the transitional provisions, think about the explanatory note, the second reading speech, think about how that comes into effect by reference to the Queensland Legislation Handbook, and then think a little more broadly in terms of some of the extrinsic materials. I'll just share the screen again to show you some of those extrinsic materials. If you've been trying to write this down, and I keep sharing and unsharing. So you might look at the prosecutor and prosecutorial guidelines, as well as the workplace health and safety explanatory note or notes. You'll see that originally I put note and then I added notes because there's a couple on this one. To be a little more specific, let's follow some links now while I've got them on the screen. Not sure where this will come up on my computer when I log into it. Of course, it's a different screen, but I'll move it across. So my recommendation is that when you're looking at the Work Health and Safety Act, you look at Queensland legislation website. You can look at Ostley as well, and I suspect that you'll probably look at a few sources. Has anyone had a good look at this website, which is the new version of Queensland legislation? Have you got a feel for the timelines, how to work your way around the material? Okay. So part of my role, my job here is to say, okay, let's take the theory and the reference to previous cases in this book, but now let's apply it to that specific legislation and use it as a template to your thinking. Now, there is another advantage here. Has anyone worked out the other advantage of using specific legislation for the examination? Well, the way I see it is that you have to prepare um, some Method of methodology for yourself for, I think, the second assessment. Is that correct? Has anyone looked at the second assessment? Sort of like the toolkit that we did in Introduction to Law. So by going through this process with this piece of legislation, it gives you a way of describing the methodology in a method that works for you. Let's share the screen again. So you need to become familiar with these point in time versions and that will be relevant of course because the law that applies to a certain circumstance will be the law as it was at that time. You'll of course need to consider the object clauses over here in section 3. You may need to consider subordinate legislation. Have a look at the legislative history and don't forget the importance of the Acts Interpretation Act and you'll see here down the bottom that the authorisation for this act, subordinate legislation, as made in the reprints, comes about as a result of the interplay of the Acts Interpretation Act and the Evidence Act. So that's just some idea of what we need to consider. Obviously, you'd be aware of the requirement to look at bills and the explanatory note, which you'll find by reference to the bills. Okay. That's all I want to show you on that site. Um, while I'm at it, I'll just um, link through to the amendment bill, which creates some of the interesting material that you may have to consider in the context of your examination. So this is the amendment bill that is particularly of interest to me, introduced to Parliament in late August this year. You'll need to 
work th through the process of determining when it became law, how it became law, where do we look to justify those sorts of statements. And essentially, if I can put it this way, with the examination question, which is based on this particular piece of legislation, you can expect a lot of W questions. From my perspective, I'll be asking questions which are like who, what, when, where, why type questions. Um, and if you are before a judge, you need to consider answers to all of those questions because the judge is likely to ask the most important question when you're on your feet making submissions, and that is why. Why should I accept your version? And what is your justification for that argument? Again, there won't be a right or wrong answer. I don't know the answer to the, the questions that you'll be faced, or the question or questions you'll be faced with in the exam, because it hasn't been um, passed, it hasn't been through the courts yet. You might get lucky, there might be a reported decision before the exam. That might make it very easy. Um, however, at this stage, there's, there's just not the case law on it. So we're dealing with really cutting edge sort of work in this. So I hope that that's okay that I've made that disclosure to you. I want you to work through that process and make it as worthwhile as possible. Are there any questions about what I've said so far? Actually, there are a few things on the check chat facility. No. Okay, and it is Queensland legislation. I, I uh, have a question. Yes, Sorry. David. Yes, David. Uh, just, it's not so much the content of the exam, it's more about the Proctor U exam that we're going to be doing. I'm just curious about how, are we going to get a little bit more insight, seeing as we're going to be the first people doing that, about how that whole thing will happen or operate and what, what's, it, what's it like actually inside that, that site? You will. I'll provide you with some materials to give you a better idea of it. Um, I think I mentioned in week one that I had a session with some people in America where they sort of explained it. I've seen a video on it, which is, um, which is good. And what you'll see is that you are assigned a proctor, which is essentially your invigilator. So it's a one-on-one -on -one type deal. And the proctor will ask you to, um, uh, if you've got a laptop or camera, you know, actually look around the room and all those sorts of things. Um, and, and, and I will give you some more information about it. Um, what my intention was that we all start the exam at exactly the same time and it's closed off at exactly the same time but I don't think that's going to happen in practice. So we've changed it slightly. I think it will be that you book in for a three-hour session and we give you a window. And the window might be between, say, 4 p.m. and 6 p.m. to start. And you're given a time that you start because that's when you're booked in with your proctor. So is it similar? Sorry, is it... Sorry, is it, uh, is it similar to the take-home exam where you sort of create a, a Word documents and upload it into it? Or is it you've got to write it into some fields within the actual program itself? No, the, uh, excellent question. The way I understand it to be, the way I want it to be, is that you create a Word document and upload that Word document. Uh, that's excellent. Yeah, that makes me happy. Now, that's a great advantage to those of you that are fast typists. Not so good for people that can't type. Mind you, I think you all know that I reckon I could beat you all in typing because I use my voice. If I was actually typing, I'd be hopeless. Um, so make sure that you have your best system for putting words onto a Word document ready to go. Yeah, it's a bit of, um, Nicole says, they're basically remote screen sharing on the computer to make sure you aren't do, do, you're not doing something you shouldn't that's that's a fair comment yeah that's consistent with what i've seen can you leave your computer screen for the kids have an emergency yet yeah, look the advantage is that it's it's for open book and i've said to them i don't you can have whatever resources you want um, so it's a little different to the normal situation where it's set up really as if it's a closed book examination and they have all sorts of systems to ensure that you know, you're locked out of the internet and things of that nature. So I don't want any of that. So we're going, f 
what I've asked for is the very basic proctor you process without all the bells and whistles. Does that make sense? So that means, yeah, you could leave your computer screen, go and see them, uh, the, the kids. <laughs> if dad can't handle the kids on the on his own um, and you can access the internet. Yes, that's my intention. That's what I want. So part of my idea of giving you this information about what the exam will be now is if we have some problems, at least you'll be, it's a huge amount to print, but at least you'll be able to access print material if, if we have some problem with the internet. But my intention is you can use the internet. All right, so thank you for those questions, David. All right. Um, now, I'm sorry for those of you that are not in Queensland. Usually when I set an assessment, I'm very happy for you to make it as practical as, I, as you can and use legislation in your state. I can't do that given that I've ended, identified this specific piece of legislation. So even though you may not be practicing in Queensland, use this opportunity as creating the template um, for, your, for your work in whatever jurisdiction you will be working. All right, any other questions at this stage? All good? Okay, so that's the exam hint for tonight. In terms of um, the assessments, I think you know the due dates, you know what's required of you. Um, I will just share the screen again just to show you a couple of other things. You're probably familiar with the Queensland Handbook, Legislation Handbook. If not, I would encourage you to do so. We'll see if we can follow a link to get that. The Queensland Legislation Handbook provides you with methodology as to how legislation and other things are created. So I'm just dragging it across into the screen now. And the um, this is from the Department of the Premier and Cabinet. The Legislation Handbook is easy to find. And one of the reasons I'm showing you this now is that it's a great resource. It will provide you with a lot of background material, the parliamentary process and royal assent, etc. Um, and then the, some comments about the explanatory notes. So use that as a resource that you can refer to as an important piece of secondary material. And of course, the explanatory notes, I'm sure that you all know how to access those. Um, what I haven't shown you is the prosecutorial guidelines. I'm going to leave you to work that out for yourself because part of the exercise in relation to this legislation is to work out who is the prosecutor and how is it prosecuted in practice. So there's some explanatory notes in relation to the uh, amendment which is relevant to um, the assessment. Okay. But you know how to find explanatory notes, so I don't need to go further than that. Okay, so it'll cover a lot of material that you need to um, learn to develop your skills in statutory interpretation. Now, we know that the Acts Interpretation Act is important. That's Commonwealth and its state. Commonwealth, Section 15AC, we talked about that last week in the context of the Commissioner of Taxation against Stone. Did we all have a look at that case? Did we get a feel for it? All right. So Section 15AC is simply a provision that says where an act expresses an idea in a form of words or a later act which tries to express ideas from previously but in a clearer style, then the idea shall not to be taken to be different merely because of the words that are used, which is all very well if we're trying to simplify, but sometimes there is some confusion. So Commissioner of Taxation and Stone, which is 2005, 222 CLR 289, involved a practical application of the problems associated with 15AC. That was where a police officer was competing professionally in Javelin um, and uh, received additional income. Question is, was the officer running a business in professional sport. Have a look at the judgment of Kirby. And in that case, the court accepted that the um, principal motivations were the pursuit of excellence and to honour herself and her country, but 
taken as a whole, the athletic activities during the relevant period constituted a business, according to the High Court. And the court took into account that her athletic talent, to, uh, which gave her money, was something more than trivial. Where you can sometimes come across information that is extremely valuable is in the context of extraneous materials. While you were looking at that case, did anyone come across any particularly interesting or valuable extraneous, extrinsic rather, materials? Anyone come across anything that they thought was interesting? Okay. What I'm getting at is the ATO sometimes puts out material and if you're dealing with particular industries, it's always good to look at government websites or perhaps industry websites because they can be a useful source of valuable extrinsic materials. So to share the screen now, to give you to show you exactly what it is that I'm trying to say. Here is some commentary by way of tax ruling from the ATO that deals specifically with the case of um, Federal Commissioner of Taxation against Stone. And you'll note that um, the tax rulings provide a view of the world by the tax office. In this one that I'm showing you, it's an amendment to an earlier ruling which clarifies the issues in relation to not only the, um, that case under review but uh, another case of Pedley. So the point that I'm making there is make sure that you look a little more broadly and consider some extrinsic materials that you think will carry some weight in an argument. And I think a taxation ruling by the ATO on a tax matter or interpretation of tax legislation will carry considerable weight. Okay, the next topic is drafting conventions. Legislation takes a pretty familiar form now, but it has changed. You've noticed that early legislation had a thing called preambles. We don't do that now. We have explanatory memoranda or explanatory notes. But Parliament will often include definition clauses, we know that, and they will often include amendments. So when there is an amendment by insertion of an Act uh, or a section into an Act, I, I guess you've all picked up now that we don't renumber the Act, we keep the numbers the same, but we'll add in like um, Section 10 Cap A. If you look at the federal legislation, Commonwealth legislation, it drives you crazy because there are so many additions into the legislation for the sake of keeping the original numbering that it actually becomes, I think, counterproductive in some ways. So explanatory memorandum or memoranda in the Commonwealth field has not always existed. It used to be preambles. The explanatory memorandum now accompanies every government bill into Parliament. That's standard practice, but it hasn't always been the case. So up until about 1990, 1982, there was no easy way of finding if an explanatory memorandum had been produced for a bill. It, wasn't, it may have been produced, but it's not readily available in the manner that we used to when we look at the Federal Register of Legislation, which is called the Legislation Register. So what I want to do is show you an online resource which is called the Index to Explanatory Memoranda and it's produced by the Commonwealth Parliamentary Library and there it is. So the intention is this document, this web page, gives you a, a way of tracking down. Okay, I'm not sharing, am I? And it even works straight away this time. Now you can see it. Can you see the explanatory memoranda? Okay. Um, this is a method of allowing for you to research if a memorandum was in fact produced. 
Because if you're trying to look for an explanatory memoranda before 1982, you won't find it easily. So this is a way that you can track it down. So have a look at the Parliament of Australia website, which is aph.gov.au, and then go across to About Parliament, Parliamentary Debates, then to the Parliamentary Library, until you can find your way to Explanatory Memoranda Index. There is an excellent overview of this material by Patrick O'Neill. And um, let's see if I can find that now, which is um, here. And this is also um, available through that same website. And it gives an excellent overview of how this works in practice. I'm not suggesting that you read all of this, but keep it up your sleeve because if you need to find some material about explanatory memoranda and you're frustrated saying, I can't find it on the Federal Register, this might be able to help. Now that's in the common law sphere. When it comes to state, we talk about explanatory notes, not explanatory memoranda, in Queensland anyway. Does anyone know the name of the act that essentially allows for the preparation of the explanatory notes and the subordinate legislation? It's kind of a, a mechanisms type piece of legislation. You'll see more detailed explanation about this in section 6.11 of the legislation handbook, but it's the Legislative Standards Act of 1992 that's the Legislative Standards Act, and Section 22 talks about the way of creating an explanatory note for departments. Again, if we go back to the Legislation Handbook, you'll, you'll see Section 6.11 deals with explanatory notes and talks about the Legislative Standards Act and Section 22. Okay. Oh, I didn't share the screen again, did I? Sorry. I'll do that now. So that's the extract that I'm talking about from the Legislation Handbook, Department of Premier and Cabinet. 6.11 deals with explanatory notes and has a brief reference to the Legislative Standards Act of 1992 and in particular Section 22. All right. Now, finding bills at the Commonwealth level, there are three ways to do it. Who can tell me how we would find a bill if we were looking for it in the Commonwealth level? Where do we go? I'll look at the chat facility or you can unmute your microphone. See who's first in. Three ways, three ways to get there. APH, uh, yes. One way. What was that, sorry? Yes, Benjamin. Uh, one way is through the Parliament website. Yes, exactly. Very good. Through APH and Sharon got that at the same time as well. Well, Two others, sure. federal legislation, yes, through the Federal Register of Legislation. And where's the third way? We all know this, we use it all the time. If you're thinking of looking at an act and you want it nice and neat, quick, Austley. Queensland legislations. I've well, you can do that, but, but, yeah. not for the, but not for Commonwealth stuff. So this sorry, is just common. Sorry no, you're right. Osley was the answer I was looking for. So you can look through the parliamentary websites. You can look through the Federal Register of Legislation. You can look at Osley. All right, so that's for Commonwealth. If you're looking for Queensland bills, where do you find it? Queensland legislation site. Yeah, pretty much the same. I think um, parliamentary website is... Um, is, is probably the way I would look. And we'll just call that up on the screen. You need all this for your second assessment piece, your toolkit, and develop a, a very clear system that works for you. So there's the Queensland Parliament website. That's how you can access bills. From that, you can access material in relation to um, Hansard and also the explanatory notes. All right, 
legislation for... Uh, can I ask a question, John? Sure. Um, I just wanted to ask you a question. When I was looking at the, for the federal stuff last week uh, in finding bills, I noticed it's really detailed, including it's got first speeches and uh, extra speeches as well. I'm just wondering, would we ever be using first speeches at any point in time or no. would there ever be any necessity for that? In practice, first speech typically is um, very mechanical. This is just introducing the bill. There's not a lot of explanation. Usually it's the second or possibly the third speech where the action is. That's, uh, I'm, I mean, I, I must confess I don't look at first reading speeches. Perhaps I should. Maybe they've changed. Maybe they might, there may be something in it. Um, if you're looking at the um, legislation that you know will be in the exam, I'd look at all of that, but just in case. But practically, no, David, to answer your question. If anyone has a different view on that or you have a different, different experience, please let us know. Okay. Now, so obviously we need to know how to find legislation. We need to find, how do we find the date of assent for Commonwealth legislation? We'd know this, wouldn't we? Yes. On the legislation, uh, it can be listed. Yes. On, or actually, it's 28 days from the date of assent that it comes into to action. But um, yeah, there's a few different places that it can be. Yeah, there are. And you're right, Ben. Uh, is it Benjamin or Ben? What do you prefer? No, oh, Ben's fine. Ben? Is that, was <laughs> that, that what, 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 is it normally Ben? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, so Ben, right. um, yeah, actually, if you look at Commonwealth legislation, it's usually there. Um, sometimes you can, you can overlook it. You can't, you, you know, it's, if it's pointed out to you, you think, oh, there it is. I can see it now. But sometimes you don't see it. But the date of assent is actually usually there on the, on the um, legislation itself. But you can go to the Act and then the related bills and the date of the assent will be shown in the left-hand column. This is in the Commonwealth legislation sphere. So don't worry if you don't know it straight off now, but what I'd recommend is that you start building a flow chart for yourself or a list or a schedule, whatever it is that works for you, that says, yes, bang, 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 I know exactly the way I like to do it. Um, I'd add in a couple of others just as reserves. So we should all know immediately how to get to legislation, how to get to bills, how to get to explanatory memoranda or explanatory notes, how to get to second reading speeches, how to get to Hansard. We should all immediately know how to get to um, um, basically all of those things um, and have it mapped out in your own mind. Okay, so second reading speeches, you can go two places, um, but essentially through Parliament. I'll just share the screen again. Now, these are just some of the ways that I recommend, but you can um, work your own systems that work for you. And I think my computer is starting to slow down. So that's where you can find some information about second reading speeches. Again, it's under that heading of bills. So I might stop that screen, share, and I'll shut down some of these um, programs. But are you still able to hear me clearly enough? It's, it's all good so far tonight? All right. Um, what else do we need? You need to be able to find out the objects for the Act, etc. Right, any questions about um, can I what it is? Yes. Yes, Jess. Um, hello. Um, so I don't know how to find the explanatory memoranda, but where do we find notes? Would that be in the same spot? Question. That's a good question. I guess what we need to do, and I'm just going to open it up to see if other, others can help you there, Jess. What's the, is there a difference between explanatory memoranda and explanatory note? And if so, what is it? Jurisdiction. Very good, Sarah. Yep. What? The explanatory man memorandum is what's used to describe the explanatory material provided with Commonwealth-based legislation, whereas an explanatory note is generally what's used to describe explanatory material provided with a state-based legislation. Yes. Well, certainly Queensland. Sometimes um, it becomes a little yeah. bit messy. It's an explanatory note in WA as well. So. As well. Yeah, I think... 
Victoria might be explanatory memorandum. I'm not sure, but certainly Queensland, and thank you, Sarah, um, in Western Australia, it's an explanatory note. So to answer your question, Jess, it's basically the same thing, but we use one terminology for Commonwealth and another for at least Queensland and Western Australia. Cool. Great, thank you. But I'm glad you asked that question. And I always forget, but <laughs> I remember now. So what's a good way of remembering? The memorandum relates to the Commonwealth and the note relates to the state. M comes before N alphabetically and C comes before S alphabetically. I don't know, that might work. You got a better one, Sarah? Speaking, you can, well, you can use actually look up explanatory memorandum for a state based legislation and it will find you the explanatory explanatory note for it um, because the system is smart enough to realize that that's what you want you want the explanatory memorandum so it's not as concerned about the final word for it and that's a fair comment as well so thank you all right so thank you for that jess all right so delegated legislation can anyone tell me about that what is it how does it come into effect what does it mean as far as statutory interpretation is concerned? Delegated legislation. Is it where legislation or the creation of it is, is delegated out to other bodies such as uh, government departments? Yes, government departments is a great example. Thank you, Nicole. You came in with that answer at the same time. And where else? I mean, what other type of, if you like, government department if you like third council councils that's the other one council bylaws would be an example exactly yes so that's all delegated legislation councils don't have any original jurisdiction to make laws everything has to be delegated to it so delegated legislation council bylaws um, it's still law um, likewise the legislative power is often conferred upon the executive so ministers government officers semi-government bodies local councils all have power conferred upon them to make laws, but that is delegated legislation. So if you're challenging, or if, if you're trying to interpret delegated legislation or challenge it in the context of a case, what's kind of the first thing that you should think about before you embark on the specifics? To see if there's any uh, federal legislation that would actually trump that council bylaw or that delegated legislation, which would have more authority over it, and, and if you're arguing a case? Yes, certainly. Um, section, what's the section in the Constitution where federal laws overtake state laws? 51. No, I don't know about 51. No, 52, sorry. Mm, is it 52? I was thinking 109, but now you've got me convinced that it's 52. So um, I'm going to go, you, you sound very convincing. Melissa came in with 52 at the same time that you did, Ben. <laughs> so now I'm really, that's why, that's why I stopped myself when I was about to say 109. It's conferred and then there's implied, isn't it? So yeah. Okay. You know, there's stuff right. that's covered and then there's stuff that isn't necessarily covered. So please learn sections 52 and 109 of the Constitution. That's the Commonwealth better than I am displaying at the moment. But that's a good point, David. But even a little bit more basic than that, you're challenging a bylaw, you're considering whether a bylaw or de piece of delegated legislation is effective. What do you do? What's the first thing you've got to do? I guess you've really got to ask yourself, has the body that created the delegated legislation done so in accordance with the delegation conferred upon it? I mean, for example, if a council is delegated authority to, to make bylaws in relation to, I don't know, dangerous dogs, and then suddenly it creates a bylaw that deals with dangerous chickens, if you're acting for someone who is prosecuted pursuant to that bylaw, you'd want to check that the council actually had the power to make the law which is being used to prosecute your client, wouldn't you? Ben, do you have any thoughts on that? Yeah, I was just going to ask, would that be a question of jurisdiction or validity? 
it's it's jurisdiction and validity. Or possibly both. Yep, yeah, it's both. But certainly validity yeah. is probably the word that comes to my mind a little more readily. So the point that I'm trying to make there is don't assume that because a council, for example, creates a bylaw, then it must have known what it was doing and it can't be challenged. It can be challenged and it should be challenged. You should certainly look at it as part of your procedure. Likewise, when you're dealing with government departments and executive action, ask yourself, what is the basis for the executive action under which my client is being prosecuted? So how would we find whether they were allowed to do that? Ah, that's a really good point. I'm not sure there's an easy answer to that. Does anyone have any thoughts? Jess has raised a very, very good point. Where do you think you'd look? I guess you'd have to follow the legislation back to the origin legislation, wouldn't you? Exactly, but how would you find out what is the origin for the legislation? So let's take this example, and I've just made it up. You know, your client has been prosecuted for having a dangerous chicken. And you say, well, that doesn't sound right. Councils don't have power to make laws in relation or bylaws in relation to dangerous chickens. Where would, you, where would be the first place that you'd look to see if that's the case, to answer Jess's question? The council website? That's probably right. That's, I think that's where I would first look. And what would you be looking for in the council website? I know what I'd be looking for. The actual bylaw, exactly. All right, so we're looking for the actual bylaw. Manoj would like to look at the animal, yep, pets to you know, to look at it. But let's we'd, we'd look at the actual bylaw, and I'd be looking at the actual bylaw to say, does this bylaw state its authority within the document? So it's probably intrinsic. You'd probably look at the actual document and it should, if properly drafted, say the authority for making this bylaw is the delegated authority or um, uh, power conferred upon the council by section 27A of the Local Government Act, Queensland. Then you can go and have a look at 20 section A. So the answer to the question for Jess is probably in the document itself, in the bylaw itself. If not, you can always ask for particulars from the prosecutor and that would be an opening question. What is the authority for the council to make this bylaw? Let the prosecutor do some work for you. Mind you, you might be the prosecutor. You might be the prosecuting authority. So you might have to go and check that out. But if you, if you really couldn't see anything in the bylaw, I would then start to look at the Local Government uh, Act and I think websites as well. So Michael says delegated powers, yes. Um, Melissa says look at the definitions. So I think all those answers are right. So, Jess, there's no one answer that we've given you, but I hope it's given you some hints. Does that answer your question well enough? Right, that's good. Okay, so what's the difference between an act and a statute? Same. Exactly. Now, how do I pronounce your name? Is it Manoj? Ma Manoj? Manoj? Okay. Manoj got it. It's the same. It's just different, different um, terms for the same thing. Act and statute can be used interchangeably. When you're referring to an act of parliament, make sure you capitalise it. It's one of my little bugbears. Make sure you type it in italics. That's another little bugbear. Those that have you worked with me in the past, you know that. We want you to make it look professional. So if you don't italicise the name of legislation, then it kind of gives away that you're not used to doing this. Having said that, a disclosure, when it comes to Ucrew, I haven't worked out how to type something in Ucrew in italics. So everything comes through in standard font. So when I type legislation in Ucrew and it comes through and it's not italicised, I, I don't like it, but um, I'm not sure I know how to do anything about it. All right, so 
when it comes to um, drafting a document, you can use your own internal dictionary. We often see that in professionally drawn documents. So, for example, uh, and this is fictional, if you're dealing with the Dolphin Preservation Society of Queensland and Northern Territory, charitable foundation, then you might put in brackets after that very long, you know, Dolphin Preservation Society. So it's your internal definition. And the way we normally do it is you describe it immediately after you say it in full. In old form drafting, when I was first, when I first started, I was taught to do it this way. Uh, we would say the long title and then we would put in brackets here and after referred to as, in inverted commas, the Dolphin Preservation Society, close inverted commas, close brackets. We, we forget about that here and after referred to as. We, we don't say that anymore. We just describe it. Okay. So it's an easier way of doing things. Um, we mentioned the Legislative Standards Act tonight. Another piece of legislation you want to keep in mind is the Statutory Instruments Act of 1992. Schedule 1 lists the provisions of the Interpretation Act that apply to statutory instruments. So a statutory instrument um, deals with things like the long title to an act and purposes of the act. So have a look at that. Um, I'll just highlight some commentary by sharing the screen just to give you an idea of what we're talking about. And thanks for your patience. You've all been very good tonight, as you always are. Oh, and you can see what I'm getting to shortly, the flow chart. But beforehand, before that, the Statutory Instrument Inter Instructions, sorry, Statutory Instruments Act 1992 deals with a number of things that bear on statutory interpretation. And whilst it is not the Acts Interpretation Act, it does have some um, use and may be used in a number of things, including what we've been discussing in part tonight, such as rules, local laws, bylaws, ordinances, etc. Right, while I'm sharing the screen, I just want to show you the flow chart. You can see the flow chart now. Does anyone know, does that look familiar, that flow chart? Okay, where's that from? Where did I get that flow chart? It's page 345. The textbook, yeah. Textbook, that's it? Okay. So it's right at the back of the textbook. It's actually, it says 345. It's not 345. That might have been the first edition. Um, oh, it's easy on page 345 and the back page. It's, it's there twice in the textbook. So the reason I'm showing you that now is that you've got to create your own methodology. That's been the session. That's been what we've been talking about tonight. You can adopt the methodology in the flowchart created by the author Michelle Sanson if you wish, but you don't have to. I'd probably create something a little different, but it's a great start. I think where it needs to be more detailed the mechanical aspects of where we, you would find the things that we talked about tonight, legislation, explanatory memorandum, explanatory notes, read, second reading speeches, etc. So maybe a combination of what we've discussed tonight and the flow chart in your textbook is the way to go. All right, so um, do we explain more a little for the assessment and reference it? When you're doing your assessments, I do want you to reference the material. If you're, um, if you're using that flow chart, you know you can just apply the principles without saying I'm doing so by reference to the flow chart. That's fine. Um, but if you actually copy it, that's a different thing. Sorry, my voice is going. Okay, are there any questions? Because I'll wrap it up shortly. All good? I'm not um, sure that we've... Um, yes. Um, I've just got a question about plain English. I'm finding it confusing. 
Yes. So plain English, English drafting is confusing. Yeah, in finding, you know how you've got to find it in the act? I'm just, like, everything looks simple in a way. Like, I know maybe in Latin and stuff could, you know, maybe be up for that it's not plain English, but there's not much used yet and I'm just lost and I'm like, is it all? No, that's and that's a fair question because given the emphasis on plain English drafting, acts now should be written in plain English. So you may find plenty of examples of plain English. Just select something that strikes you as being very well written and very efficiently written if you're looking for an example of plain English, English drafting. Okay, you, because even like, because maybe one's amended at 2017, but the original one's like 1980 or something. So do we look at, could we compare the two, would you say? Yeah, that's exactly what I was about to say. If you, if you look at older legislation, you'll get a feel for what we mean by the difference between plain English drafting and the nonsense okay. that we used to collectively uh, uh, promote in the past. Okay. All right, I didn't think of that. And then when I said it, I was like, oh. No, that's okay. good. No, great question. Thank yeah, you, Amelia. All right. Can I ask uh, a quick question? Yes, David. Um, we're talking about plain English, and um, I just know also from other areas that just the whole idea of archaic language leaving the, 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 the system of law. When exactly did that happen and kind of how much of a dramatic shift and how sudden was it? Was it just suddenly was there and then there was a whole movement and it was gone to within a matter of a days or how did that come about and how quick was it? I, I can answer that with some authority because I've lived through it. When I first started to study in the late 70s and I started to practice in the early 80s, we were not using plain English. Nobody even talked about plain English. Then it kind of just hit it came through, I think, academic circles and it filtered through pretty quickly. So it wasn't long that we were all working towards a redrafting technique that was very simple. And uh, I would say late 80s and through the 90s was the initial impetus for plain English drafting and it's just continued from and become refined since then. Was there any sort of incidents that triggered that off for the, the movement sort of start in academic circles and then filter through to a practical level or not really? That part I, that part I can't say. Um, it just arrived um, and, I, and I don't know if there was a specific trigger for it. There probably was, but I'm not familiar with that. But I know the terminology, I know when it occurred. John, when they talk about... Yes, um, redrafting it into simple plain English and they're saying that the new drafting doesn't change the old meaning. Now, so we come through, we're only going to learn the new meaning. So eventually it is going to change the meaning because we're not going to go and learn the new plain meaning then go back and look at the old one and confer, are we, like 50 years time? Well, unless you have a situation like the Commissioner of Taxation and Stone yeah. where there's some reason that you might have to look back. But, yeah, you're right. Um, planning drafting will simply certainly become the norm. And um, I guess if you look at even the legislation that we, we had in the 70s compared to the old English legislation uh, writing style, that seemed very archaic at the time. And even now, material written in the 70s seems archaic. So, yes, I guess it, it will just be a matter of um, developing on from there. Hope that answers your question, Michael. Yes. Thank you. Um, and remember for the assessment, if you want to use legislation from your state, then you can do so. Um, it doesn't have to be Queensland. The only real requirement for Queensland legislation will be the exam, as we discussed earlier tonight. All right, any other questions, comments? All uh, yes. yes, Jess? I have one question. Um, I'm trying to find the second reading speeches. Um, I'm on the Parliament of Australia website and I've got a page open that says second reading speeches, but, like, there's nothing there. Like, you can't search for anything. Okay. It may be an older piece of legislation or is it current legislation? No, I'm just in a page that says, like, all second reading speeches. Oh, Okay. 
Yeah, I'm not sure I can answer that one too readily. That might be a you crew question. Okay. Would you mind? And you could even give us a link and we'll all have a look at it and we'll try and give you some, some help with that. How does that sound? I found you have to go into a particular piece of legislation and have a look at it individually to sometimes find it that way. I remember encountering something similar myself when I was looking last week. Okay. Thank you. Thanks, David. Good question, Jess, and thank you, David. All right. Okay, so again, any state or jurisdiction that you would like to use is fine by me for the assessment piece. Okay, all good. Thank you very much for your patience. We'll end the meeting now. We will see you next week. Make sure you start working on your flowchart and definitely read the legislation for the examination and start using that as the week by week material. Okay. Uh, John. Yes, yeah, sorry. Yes, Sarah. Yes, just um, just as a thing, will you post the name of the legislation in Ucru? That way we I won't will. that we won't accidentally type the wrong one. Yes, I will. Now I'll right. de I'll d disclose that formally. Right, thank Excellent. you. All right. All the best. We'll see you next week. Bye then.